Oh, maybe now I'm in stereo. Two, uh, two, uh, two going here. Well, we have a friend in uh, South Africa at Richards Bay, and uh, he's, uh, he talks about the ships at anchor where he is. And it, it, is, uh, it, it is not in a sheltered harbor. You're going to take my mic away. I wasn't behaving. Okay. Let's get this. There you go. Thanks. Um, the ships at uh, anchor there, they've got a tough job. The anchor's got a real tough job because oftentimes these ships that are sitting there are in the midst of a storm because it's not in a sheltered harbor. And, and truly, you could say, you know, will your anchor hold there? And this is often what we are faced with. And I'm so glad to see everybody here today. The fellowship that we need, and they, to see the, everybody together with their young families, uh, I'm greatly encouraged to see that. Uh, we need the fellowship of each other. We need to be encouraged. Um, when we leave these doors to go out to our, th our lives the rest of the week, we are facing many, many challenges. And we need to be, come together here to be refocused and to look to the Lord for his leading and guiding here. We were uh, on board a ship there. I think some of you may recognize Carl there in the red plaid jacket there. Me and Carl were going on ships together, and we, of course, were ministering on the freighters, not the cruise ships, but in Vancouver, we just do the freighters. And as we went on board, the fellow in the very back in the orange uh, jumpsuit there, uh, he was the second officer, and we'd had many conversations with him. And uh, he was supposed to have uh, come to the center, and then it didn't work out, and we went to visit him, and so he called together all these guys, even though they were sailing in just a few short hours, he called together these guys and Carl was able to share a message with them there. I am amazed as I work with Lighthouse, the, the opportunities that we have to bring the gospel to them. And we never know what it's going to be like. Every day is a different day. Every day brings us a new situation. And you know, it's about prayer. And, and looking to the Lord for a wor uh, words from the Bible to speak to them. And we run into so many different situations, and it, we're, we're just thrilled with what's going on. It's different. Uh, our centers are not seeing the same use that they certainly used to. The one in North Vancouver has greatly increased. They've been seeing sailors come to the center four or five nights a week the last couple of months. The one at Fraser, Surrey, uh, still much less, but our opportunities on board are great. So we're very thankful for that, and we covet your prayers. And this is what we need. We need the Lord's blessing here uh, to guide and direct us. Uh, here's uh, Carl with a couple of Chinese sailors showing them one of our voice players, and I think I maybe talked about that last time, uh, from In Touch Ministries, Charles Stanley. And so they give us these little MP3 voice players. They got their solar powered or plug in, and uh, they can listen to the word of God. And this this one here, either in Chinese or in English, but we have about 30 different languages that we can give out. And uh, as I was talking to one uh, crew there, and showing it to him, and he says he pulls out of his pocket. He says, "I already got one," and he was listening to it. And while they're uh, on long hours on the bridge or some place where they're just kind of on duty keeping an eye on things, we are finding they're listening to the Word of God. And it's the power of the Word of God. And we're just thrilled with this uh, new opportunity that uh, we've only been using for the last year or two. There we go. Uh, this was a, a Bangladeshi sailor that was at the center in North Vancouver on uh, Monday night. Most of the Bangladesh sailors are, are Muslim. Most people in Bangladesh are Muslim. And there he is, he loved that sign, so he's up there going like this. I, I loved it, I wanted to take a picture of him there. And he was, uh, he's a cadet. But he was so interested to hear the word of God. And he was able to, we were able to give it to him. He had excellent English, uh, so we were able, 
uh, we gave it to him in, in English at that time, but uh, we we're so privileged to be able to meet these people from around the world to give them the gospel. This is the ship I was on on Friday. I was on it earlier in the week, and I got a very cold reception from the captain. No, the crew were not allowed ashore, and no, you're not allowed in the ship. I said, well, could I just talk to a few of the guys on the gangway? Well, that would be okay. This was a Ukrainian captain. But he had with him there uh, the superintendent who had flown in from Greece because the ship is about to grow to, dr to dry dock soon, so they got to make sure they got everything laid out, what work has to be done. So I wasn't sure if he was just performing for the superintendent or not. But I got a very cold reception. Matter of fact, the other ship there that I had been on that week, I also got a very stiff reception. But Friday, I went back there uh, to go to this other vessel. And as I pull into the port, I realized I was confused about which vessel had left and which one was still here. And it was this one here. And I think, oh, I'm not even sure I would have come to this port if I had known it was this vessel. Because I got such a bad reception from them. Well, I went, I'm there. The Lord leads me. And so I went on board, and I was warmly welcomed. And um, I, they normally get you to sign in and give you a tag. And so the guy says, oh, come with me. I'll take you in. And I said, well, do I need a tag? Oh, you don't need a tag. And he just leads me right in, and we go to the ship's office, and nobody's there. He says, I'll take you to the mess room. And it was lunchtime. So we go into the mess room, and here's all these guys sitting there, just hanging out. They're about to depart in a few hours, so their operations were finished, and so they're just kind of waiting for the time to uh, get the engine prepared to leave. I had a wonderful time with them, and what really excited me at the end is the one that's beside me, um, he says to me, can we take our picture together? Well, I know that if they want to take my picture, we, we've connected. And I can tell you, I'm sharing the gospel with them. I'm talking about sin. And I'm talking about sin in my own life. And about the secrets that we all have. And they relate to that. They understand that. And I'm not accusing them. I'm accusing myself. And they know about the sin in their own heart. And so I just had a wonderful opportunity to share with them. And I was, I was so thankful for that uh, short time there. You know, uh, I'm not sure if any of you have been down to Ogden Point yet. Uh, I hope you have. I hope you get involved. It's a great work. And you're so encouraged with how many people are coming uh, off the ships. Uh, when we first heard that the ships were going to start coming back here again, I was certainly praising the Lord, but I can tell you, I was also praying that they'd actually get off the ship. Well, they have. Not all are getting off, but many are getting off, and they're having some wonderful opportunities. And I got a message this morning from my friend in Alaska, Scott Johnson. And, of course, Alaska is a big cruise ship port uh, up by Anchorage. And he says, we're getting overwhelmed. Please pray for us. He says that there's so many crew coming off. We're having such a good time. But it's just day after day, long days, long days for all of the volunteers up there, all of the workers. And he says, now they're getting all these packages shipped into our center. He says, we're soon going to be overflowing with Amazon packages here. And he says, please pray for us. So would you please remember these ones that are uh, working right now with the cruise ships? It's been two or three years since most of these ports have had cruise, cruise ships come in. And so it's just been a great opportunity. And many of them have fellowships on board, and they are, um, we're, we're, they're doing a great job, and they're trying to start uh, fellowships. And... They've been totally disrupted for a couple of years, but they're trying to get them going again. And unlike on a freighter, when somebody signs off, they may never sign back onto that ship again. There's a good possibility they'll never come back to the ship. On a cruise ship, uh, you basically just go home for a short vacation, and then you come back to the same, same ship, same position, same room, everything is the same. So it's more of a home. We're on a, on a freighter. They're nine months on board, they go home, and then they look to be reassigned after a few months, and um, they typically do not come back to the same ship. They'll stay with, with the same company, but not to the same ship. So this is where the, uh, the fellowships on board are wonderful, 
And of course, we've seen pictures of them even having baptisms on board. It's just wonderful to hear how the Lord is working. It's, so we, we do covet your prayers. Yeah, you know, the world we're living in right now, what's happening? You know, as I look around things, um, I would say in my short years on this earth, uh, I've never seen world conditions as they are right now. And when I was here, I think it was in September, I thought things were bad. I can tell you, things are worse. What's happening? Where are we at here? There's so much attack around us. We meet many sailors from Ukraine. I, I asked one young fella, how is your family? I said, we're praying for them. He says, my family got out. But he says, my home, gone, gone. There's nothing left of my home. Another captain told us, he says, all my properties that I invested in, gone. I'm actually amazed at how cheerful they are considering what they've all gone through. Can you imagine that all your life savings, all your work that you have, all the investment that you think I've got so much equity in my home and something hits it and it's gone? These men are uh, certainly facing a lot there. Myanmar. I was on a ship there that had Myanmar sailors. And a, a few months back, I was talking to a captain. And he told me, he says, when I go home, he says, I'm going to get it by a gun, and I'm joining the fight against the military coup. So it's been just over a year. The country's a mess. These poor people. You wonder, what in the world is going on? Sri Lanka. I don't even understand what has brought their country down. But it's in total economic chaos. They have no foreign currency. The leaders have abandoned them because their pockets are full. They're not going hungry but they cannot buy anything outside of their own country because they have no foreign currency. Yemen, yeah. You know, uh, Andreas Kappers, his brother and sister were missionaries in Yemen. And the, the civil war that's going on there, backed by other countries. You, you wonder, what's going on here? And you may think, well, sure glad I don't live there. Sure glad I live in Canada. Things are peaceful in Canada. Well, are they? Uh, not really. We've got so many other problems around us. The flooding that happened in the Fraser Valley. My wife has 11 family members that lived out in that flood zone. And the one there, they had uh, water up to the countertops. Um, what's going on around here? Oh, yeah, that there. I'm not sure. I don't think that's Victoria, but I know you still got things going on there. So we wonder what in the world's going on in inflation. Things are jumping in, uh, up in prices, and you're wondering, what's next? Where is this going to go to? What's happening here? This is what the Lord says in John 16. Jesus answered, the, answered them, in the world you will have tribulation. Well, we know that's true. But I'm, I'm not showing you the whole verse here. And I want to show you the, all what it says there. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations. We're seeing that. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I need to be reminded of that. Now you think, when, when did the Lord write this? Did the, Lord, did the Lord say this uh, after he rose from the dead? No. This is just before he was going to be betrayed by a friend. He was going to be taken captive. He was going to be imprisoned. His best friends were going to leave him. What does he say? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I think of what we are facing right now. And what does the Lord say? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, I am concerned 
for families right now. And really that has led me to what I'm thinking and talking about today. The attack that is on families. And I'm so glad to see all the children here. And I think sometimes I hear things, and I remember there was something came up, it hit the news there about a year or two ago. And when I heard this, my first words out of my mouth without even thinking was this, I don't want grandchildren. To think of what they would be raised in. Well, we have a granddaughter now, and I love my granddaughter. And I realized that my attitude, my thoughts toward it were, were actually not right. The Lord says, I have overcome the world. And the Lord knows exactly the situation that we're facing today. And he says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We are not alone. We're not on our own. We are not going out into this world and by ourselves, lost, just kind of making our way along, facing what, whatever may, the world may throw at us. We're not. The Lord knows every single detail. And he could say that before he was going to be whipped, spit upon, the beard pulled from his cheek, nailed to a cross, the cross being stood up and dropped into a hole. He could say that right before he was going to face this. He didn't say this afterwards, saying, okay, I, I survived, I'm okay, uh, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. No, he said that before he went through all this suffering. And this so amazed me here. You know, if we focus on the daily news, I can tell you, we will be discouraged. We will be fearful. If we look to the word of God, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 17, if you could turn to John 17. This is the Lord praying just before he goes to the cross. This is just... This is what he prays just after he says, be of good cheer. All that he is facing, and this is what he writes. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and say, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all the flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. We're going to skip down a few verses here, just for time's sake. I, verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. That's us. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. I tell you, this, this I knew was getting my attention because I was concerned about the world conditions. I am concerned about the world conditions. But the Lord has left us here for a purpose. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. That's what God wants for us today. That his joy is fulfilled in us today. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Oh, don't be surprised, folks. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. The Lord told us that. Because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And that is my prayer today, that the Lord keeps us from the evil one. And I think of our children, our grandchildren, those that we treat as children, those that we shepherd. 
we want to keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I hope that today you look forward to coming here, to being with family, your Christian family, the fellowship that you have, that you are one, and that you didn't come here out of duty or out of a chore, but you came here because you wanted to be with your family again. You wanted to be one together. There's a couple of verses I wanted to look at in particular from here. It says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. And then it says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Then at the last there, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I have come to understand a bit better what sanctify means. I always thought of it more of just, you know, set apart for God. But sanctify to set apart for a special use or purpose. I always just thought of it was just setting something aside for God's use. You know, making it, we'd say, holy. Uh, Miriam Webster says, to set apart to a sacred purpose or to a religious use. I found this uh, online when I was searching up sanctify and what it means there. It says the generic meaning of sanctification is the state of proper functioning. To sanctify someone or something is to set that person or thing apart for the use intended by its designer. A pen is sanctified when used to write. Well, if you're like me, I use my pen as any tool. I use it to poke hole in things. I, I use it to, uh, you know, maybe poke somebody. Um, but that's not its purpose. When I use it to write, then it is, I'm sanctifying it. It is being used for the intended purpose. Eyeglasses are sanctified when used to improve sight. In the theological sense, things are sanctified when they are used for the purpose God intends. A human being is sanctified, therefore, when he or she lives according to God's design and purpose. To live an, a, an un, a sanctified life is not unnatural, but is the natural way God intended for us to be. In the garden, God expected us to live a sanctified life. That's the way he set things up. Unfortunately, we are sinners, and the flesh makes, live, makes living a sanctified life more unnatural, not easy. But God has made a way for us. He has given us his word, the truth of his word. We know that without God's word, we would never be sanctified. We would take all of God's beautiful designs and misuse them, pervert God's perfect designs. When we do this, we are usually so blind that we cannot see that we are actually hurting ourselves in our desire for pleasure. We are using them not the way they were intended. So to be sanctified is to be doing things the way God wanted us to be, the way we were designed to be. It's not just to become some holy person that, that's a little weird for all the things that they say and do and the way that they act. No, it's the way God wanted us to be, the way that God designed us to be. I, I know this is a puzzle, and it's intended to be a puzzle. But I look at that there, and I'm going, what a mess. Now, some of you maybe are good at Rubik's Cube, but I remember when they came out, I think, in about the 80s sometimes. 
And to me, it was impossible to put it right. And the only way I could get it right is to peel the stickers off and move them around. But I watched some people with one hand able to do that. And this is what they do. That's what God wants for us. God wants to take a mess and make it right. He wants us to be sanctified, to follow what he has set up for us. And when we do that, we are so blessed. And of course, we are trying to teach our children these things. He wants to restore proper order. And so what does he say? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Let me assure you, you will never get to this in your spiritual life if you're not in this. We need to be in the word of God. John 10.10 10 tells us, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We see that all over the place. Jesus writes, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That's a sanctified life. And we're going to get that through the word of God. When we are, we set ourselves back in the way that God intended. I know we're still sinners. But that's what prayer is for. That's what repentance is for. That's what turning back to God's word is for. That's why we come together. So we can hear the word of God. We can be challenged by each other. If you're like me, you probably fight against the teaching of God sometimes. You resist the teaching of God. You may even envy sinners and what they're able to do and get away with. Let's trust God that he knows best. He loves us 100%. He wants the very best for us. He has the best way. The sooner we are willing to follow him 100%, the better our life will be. I'm working on it. I'm struggling. Some days I feel I'm ahead. Some days I know I'm backwards. Lord, help us. You know, the adjustable wrench is not for the nail, nor the hammer for a screw. And we'll do ourselves a favor the sooner we get things figured out. And even though we, our desire is for certain things, the sooner we figure out that that's part of the flesh, that's the sinful nature, we need to set that aside the better off we will be. I got a kick out of this one here. I like my tools. The box clearly says hammer, drill. Okay, looks like he's using it for the ha as a hammer. I guess this skilled tradesman thought he had a multi-purpose tool, a hammer and a drill. This kind of reminds me of the way some people misquote the Bible. <laughs> yeah, it says that, but that's not the meaning. Yeah, we need to go back to what God says. So we do ourselves a big favor when we sanctify ourselves by the truth, by God's truth. But this is the other verse. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to stay away from the evil one. How many times do I think I can flirt with sin? I can just kind of get close to the edge. And I, I won't get caught. I won't fall over. No, no. We need to stay far and clear. My dad loved illustrations. I love illustrations. And I remember him telling about a, 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 an illustration there about a young fellow that went for a job as a truck driver. And there was three men in there all applying for the same job. And the owner of the truck says to them, you know, if you're going up a hill and there's a steep bank on the side and you've got a full load behind you, how close do you think you can run to the edge of that cliff? And one guy says, well, I could probably get within a, a, a three feet of it. Okay, and he says to the next guy, how close could you get? I could get within two feet of it. And he goes to the third guy, how close could you get? He says, I'd stay as far away from it as I could. Guess who got the job? The truck driver wanted to protect his investment. You know, sometimes I think in our own lives, we try to see how close we can get to the world. Uh, don't do that. Stay away far and clear from the evil one. We are in a war. I showed you pictures of the wars that are going on in different parts of the world. But let me tell you, we are in a much greater war than that. 
much greater than that. If you could turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, st able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Are we in an evil day? Yes, we are. Right is being called wrong. Wrong is being called right. There is a great war, and it's not just about us. It's about our children. But God has not left us alone. God in his mercy has given us the whole armor of God. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which we can ex extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplications. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. God in his mercy has given us the tools to fight against the devil. And we need it. We need it for ourselves. We need it for our family. What has God given us? The belt of truth. We need to be in God's word so we are not deceived by any ideas of the world. Satan is a master deceiver. He makes things sound right. He makes things sound logical. But he isn't. He's going against the word of God. The soldier's belt held everything together. So does the truth of the word of God. One line I use with the sailors. In the end, the only thing that matters is truth. On every ship, the second officer, his job is to plot the navigational plan. You know, they can leave from here heading back to Asia. They can sail for two weeks. Everything is going fine. They're missing all the low pressure systems. They're having good speed. Everything's fine. The wind is behind them. But if they end up in the wrong port, they have failed. In the end, the only thing that matters is truth. And that's what we got to realize. We can have all of our teaching, all what we believe, all, what, all the illustrations that Ray or somebody else uses. We need the word of God. That's what matters. The breastplate of righteousness. This guards our hearts and our lungs, our life. Righteousness protects our spiritual life. This is following Christ, the righteous one. The gospel of peace. Peace with God. That's the good news. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. Yes, I know you know this. But I want to remind you, remind yourself daily, enjoy this peace. I have peace with God. No one higher, no one greater, no one else that I have to have peace with. I have to have peace with God. The shield of faith, trusting the Lord. What is faith? Well, faith, of course, is putting your trust in something that you don't know the answer to, you don't know the outcome. It's unknown yet, but when you trust the Lord, you do know the answer. But it's walking, we say, by faith, not by sight. Not always easy, but that's what God calls us to do. Trusting the Lord, his works make Satan's arrows, his fears, the news have no effect on us. We already know the final outcome by faith. The helmet of salvation. Since we are in a spiritual battle, we need to protect our mind where the spiritual battlefield is for us. Assurance of salvation, peace with God, faith in God protects us. And the sword of the spirit, 
The spirit sword is the word of God. How can we think that we can fight against Satan with our logic if even the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God, uses the word of God? How much more should we use it? I get oftentimes led into little debates, and I'm using my logic and my illustrations. No, no, no. I need the word of God. That's, it is sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what I need to be sticking to. And prayer, praying reminds us our total dependency on the Lord. It sets our mind in the proper condition. We are coming before the Lord. I have families, an old classic picture there. I'm concerned for our families. Satan is trying to destroy them. He's trying to weaken them all around. You know, there are things being taught in elementary school that I can tell you I never even knew about till after I got out of high school. And yet they're being taught to children now. We need to protect them. And I gotta tell you, parents, now more than ever, we must stand fir firm in the truth of God. Another old classic Norman Rockwell picture here. To me, there is nothing more pathetic than to see older Christian parents waving, wavering in their practice belief setting a bad example for kids. Some of them are now following their kids. I'm sorry, but we must follow the word of God. I watched my parents, and I seen that they continued to do what they taught me as a young one. Until my mother passed away, and my father now, his mind is not clear enough to make any decision, but even then I know that he still loves the word of God and is following the word of God. We must rem remain strong and firm because even though I think uh, I, I, I rejected some of the things my parents taught, I still watched them. And I believe my children are still watching us. Yeah, we need more of this, more listening to the word of God. And I love this picture here. It's very sad that this is the world that we live in, but it's true. And there you see a little child protected by his mother against the fiery arts the darts of satan the flaming darts of satan and there he is oblivious to what's going on i believe i was raised in a very protective home and i thank god for that and that's what we need to be doing with our children raising them under the word of god we need to be looking to each other to help Joining together. I love to hear of all the events for the young people. That's wonderful. We need to keep them together. We need to protect them from the things that are going on around us. A great verse from Nehemiah. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the pe people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Dear ones, we are in a battle. We need to fight for our children. We need to be continually bringing them the word of God. Things are not getting better, but we need to go back to the word of God. And what does he say? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you have overcome the world. And we are not waiting to see the outcome. We are not waiting to see what's going to happen. We already know. And Lord, we're thankful that we can trust in you. And Lord, you are the powerful one. You are the mighty one. I pray for all the young children here. And even now as they are in Sunday school, Lord, that you would bless them. That they would hear your word. That they would trust in you, Lord, as their own Savior at a very young age. And we pray that you would give the parents help to protect them from the evil one. And may we all work together uh, to help each other. Thank you for this assembly. Bless each one. Bless us this day. Give us opportunities to share this wonderful news with others. And we pray, Lord, that as the word goes out at Ogden Point and in other ministries and other ways, Lord, that your name would be glorified, that people would hear the wonderful news of salvation and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us, we pray. We give thanks for all your goodness to us in our Savior's name. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, didn't get finished everything.
But that's okay. Uh, we want to put our trust in the Lord and put on the whole armor of God. God bless us.